Good afternoon. Oh, good. All right. It's raining. I know it's 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 not what we would like, but but it's not snowing, so it's good. For those of you who are new to Case Western Reserve, I'm Barbara Snyder, president, and it is my privilege to welcome you to our campus. After a weekend where much of the nation was transfixed by the final stages of the battle to pass a health care bill, it seems especially appropriate that we gather today for the Lewis Stokes Leadership Symposium on social issues and the community. Like all of you, I am looking forward to hearing the reflections of today's speaker. Because of the events in Washington, she is still in Washington and will be joining us through the magic of technology via video conference. Before we begin, I want to thank all of you for being here today. I want to extend a special acknowledgement to our guests from area organizations, as well as to the more than 200 middle and high school students who are here with us today. The schools represented include Hannah Gibbons, Glenville, John Hay, Cleveland Heights, and the MC Squared STEM School. Finally, I want to say a special thank you to our two distinguished faculty respondents who are participating in today's symposium, Professors Joseph White and David Miller. Thank you both so much for, for engaging with us this afternoon. Now I want to introduce our first speaker for this afternoon, our con Congresswoman for our district, the 11th District of Ohio, Congresswoman Marsha Fudge, who like our program speaker, will speak to us by a video conference link from the Capitol. Congresswoman Fudge cares passionately about both health care and education. We are grateful to her for her commitment on these two critical issues as well as to her dedication to hearing from her constituents on both of those and many other issues. She's forged a very strong relationship with Case Western Reserve University in a short time, and we look forward to many more opportunities to work together. Congresswoman Fudge. Thank you very, very much. Uh, to my friend Congressman Stokes and uh, President Snyder, the faculty, the students and guests, welcome. Uh, I, I really do wish that I could be with you. Um, sorry that we're not physically with you, but this was so very important that we had to work this technology piece out today. We are doing the very best we can. I, as you know, you may have heard that we had a, a little matter called health care reform last night that had Congress pretty busy. And to the students in the audience, if you think you've had a lot of homework to do, let me tell you, I have pulled a couple of all-nighters this week. I pulled an all-nighter on Thursday after the final changes were made to the bill and it was released. I think I've done more reading on this issue than for any course I ever took in law school. But that's okay, because that's what my constituents expect of me, and that is what I expect of myself, to do my homework and to thoroughly understand the issues that affect the people I represent at home. It is important to know that I did not make this decision lightly and ultimately decided that it was in the best interest of the community. And as I gathered my thoughts for my remarks this afternoon, it occurred to me how the battle over health care brings the issues of leadership to the forefront. For me, the goal was not to pass a popular bill, but one that would achieve the greatest good. It's about speaking for those in need and those without a voice. As such, I decided to speak for the more than 86,000 uninsured people in the 11th district. I decided to speak for the 9,000 uninsured people in my district who have pre-existing conditions. And for some of you students, let me tell you what a pre-existing condition might be. It might be asthma. It might be acne. It might be obesity. It might be high blood pressure. It might be any number of things that the average person may have. Not that they're a bad thing, but that's what are called pre-existing conditions. I decided to improve Medicare for the 97,000 seniors in the district, and I decided to assist the 1,600 families who went bankrupt over health care-related expenses they could not afford. Leadership means making tough decisions and taking tough stands. 
The first test of leadership is to listen, to understand the issue, and then to act. And in this case, I know I served my community by taking a stand to allow others to obtain affordable, accessible, quality health care. I believe that there are some exciting opportunities in this historic bill for growth at Case Western Reserve University, for our community and for other universities in our area as well. It helps students by allowing them to stay on their parents' health care plan until the age of 26. The bill contains not only health reform, but equally important, it, re it contains education reforms. Students will not be forced to spend more than 10 percent of their income on loan repayments beginning in 2014. It's important. If you like that, you're really going to like this. Students' federal loans will be completely forgiven after they make 20 years of payments. And that's for students who borrow after 2014. There are financial incentives for public health workers and medical students who work in medically underserved areas or with medically underserved populations. There are new grants that will be awarded to nursing schools to strengthen nurse education and training programs. And for the first time, faculty at nursing schools will become eligible for loan repayment forgiveness and scholarship programs. And those are just some of the highlights. As a member of the Education and Labor Committee, I regularly work on issues that matter to CASE and the education community in general. My door is always open to hear your concerns on education or any issue for that matter. I also sit on the Science and Technology Committee. It is a great place to be to support the vibrant research that takes place at CASE Western Reserve. The United States leads the world in many aspects of science, engineering, math, and technology. But we can't forget, we can't afford to take the, compet the, the competitive advantage for granted. Renewing investment in research and development and strengthening the education system are critical to maintaining leadership and producing the innovation that can solve our energy needs and foster economic growth. Cleveland is so fortunate to have this premier university as one of our great assets. We call on you for your expertise and partnership to improve the economic well-being of our region and to improve the lives of our residents. I commend the Cleveland Cornerstone Store Project, in which your staff, Dr. Snyder, uh, and your students have worked with small grocers to improve the availability of fresh fruits and vegetables and other wholesome, food, wholesome foods for our people, especially young people. That's an example of leadership. I thank you for the little things you do, and I thank you for the grand vision that makes this university great. When I'm in Washington, I am so proud to list Case Western Reserve as one of our community's important institutions. A special thank you to my friend, my mentor, Congressman Stokes, for his extraordinary leadership, and to my friend who you will hear shortly, the Honorable Representative Lee of California, for her outstanding leadership on health care and many other things. I want you to know she did as much as any single person to get us to the point where we are today. Thank you all. I hope you enjoy the rest of your program. Thank you so much for your wonderful support of higher education and research, the things that are so important to those of us at Case Western Reserve. It's great for our students, our faculty, our staff, our alumni, and we think the entire Northeast Ohio community. So we are truly grateful. You have been a wonderful partner, and again, we look forward to continuing to work with you. Now it is thank my you. honor. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> Now it is my honor to introduce a man who exemplifies great leadership. He is the man for whom this symposium is named, in fact. He was a member of the House of Representatives for three decades. Congressman Stokes devoted his career to advancing the rights of others, 
Before he began his career in politics, he practiced law for 14 years, enjoying much success, including taking three cases to the United States Supreme Court. Today, he serves as distinguished visiting professor at our own Mandel School of Applied Social Sciences, the number 10 ranked school of social work in the nation, according to US News. <laughs> And we are so fortunate that our students benefit from his wisdom and experience all the time on our campus. It is truly a privilege for me to introduce Congressman Lewis Stokes. Thank you very much, President Snyder, Dean Cleve Gilmore, Provost William Baslick, Dr. Joseph White, Dr. David Miller, Mayor Gary Norton, our distinguished guest speaker, Congresswoman Barbara Lee, and our own beloved Congresswoman Marsha Fudge, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, President Snyder, for your very kind and warm remarks. I'm sure that I speak for our entire university when I say how proud we are of the outstanding leadership that you are giving to this great university. Thank you. I want to thank you also for the very strong support that you've always given this program. It has meant so much to me to have your strong support. I want to also thank you, Dean Cleve Gilmore, for the leadership you've given as Dean of the Mandel School of Applied Social Sciences, where I'm proud to be a member of your faculty. Your support over the years has been crucial to the success of this symposium, and I thank you for that strong support. Also, I want to say to Adrian Zizak, we also owe you and your colleagues uh, for our appreciation for the labor of love that you put forth each year and the tedious arrangements necessary to get our speakers to this campus. It's a very challenging job, but all of you, you and your colleagues, handle it so very well. It is impossible to convey to all of you who are here today the great pride that I take in presenting Congresswoman Barbara Lee to you today. It is also an honor to have with her our own beloved Congresswoman Marsha Fudge. Marsha, you should have heard this audience, and I hope you did hear them when you were introduced. We love you, and they manifested it in such a beautiful way with the kind of applause that you were given here today. It is because of the wonderful job that you're doing representing us in the United States Congress. Since the inception of this symposium, I have brought to this campus uh, some of the Congressional Black Caucus's most distinguished members, national icons like John Lewis, Charlie Rangel, Mel Watt, Maxine Waters, and John Conyers. Today, I am honored to introduce to you the chairperson of the Congressional Black Caucus, one of the 42 African-American men and women who today occupy a historic place in the United States Congress. This is also a historic moment at this university. Just a few hours ago, these two Congresswomen participated in a historic vote in Congress in which they voted on landmark legislation giving this nation the first health care bill in its entire history. <laughs> President Barack Obama last night described the passage of this bill as answering the call of history. We are honored that just a few hours later, 
that we have the opportunity to share in this victory. I came to know Congresswoman Barbara Lee when she was an intern in the office of one of my best friends, Congressman Ron Dellums, who is now the mayor of Oakland, California. She quickly rose to become his chief of staff. And following this stint in Washington, she returned to California, where she was elected to the California State Assembly and served six years there before being elected to the California State Senate, where she also served two years. In 1998, she was elected to succeed Congressman Dellums when he retired. She has also had an outstanding legislative career, which in 2009 resulted in the Congressional Black Caucus electing her as their chairperson. When I speak of her outstanding legislative career, one of her votes attracted international attention. Following September 11th, when Congress gave President Bush the authority to go into Iraq, she was the only member of the House or Senate to vote no. It was one of the most courageous votes ever cast in any Congress. The events since then have established that was also the right vote. Congressperson Lee is a fierce advocate for legislation to stop the spread of HIV AIDS. She's also been a leader in fighting to end genocide in Darfur and for the eradication of poverty around the world. In presenting her to you today, the Mandel School of Applied Social Sciences is proud that our speaker has a social work background. She has a Master's of Social Work degree from the University of California, Berkeley. I am sure that this plays an enormous role in her concern about the social ills of our society and her commitment as a legislator to change public policy. It is indeed an honor to present to you an outstanding woman, a friend, a leader in Congress, and one of the nicest people I know, Congresswoman Barbara Lee. Good morning. For, this works. <laughs> let me, let me first thank my friend, a former colleague, and a man who has been a mentor to me and to so many of us here in Congress, Congressman Lou Stokes, for that wonderful introduction. Lou, um, I miss you. I know that all of you recognize and know that Congressman Stokes is an icon in Cleveland, but he is an icon to us in Washington, D.C. and across this country. His legacy, his footprints, his brilliant legislative agenda continues to live on in the Congress, in the Congressional Black Caucus, and throughout the country. And Lou, I just have to tell you once again, thank you on behalf of my congressional district. When I first was elected in 1998, I believe you were chair of the Labor HHS subcommittee of the Appropriations Committee, which I now serve on. Well, Congressman Stokes helped me figure out my very first appropriations for my district, and that was an a, a earmark, which are good, let me tell you, taking our tax dollars home, directing them back to our districts, helped me get a, an earmark for a homeless program that really helped shelter many of our homeless young men and women. So thank you, Lou, for helping me when I first came here to Congress and for your mentorship. We miss you, but uh, and I wish I were there with you today. But once again, uh, you know what we're doing. And I have to acknowledge uh, my sister friend and colleague, Congresswoman Marsha Fudge. You know she's come to Congress and really hit the ground running. She's been a tremendous help to me during my tenure as chair of the CBC. She anchors uh, the CBC Message Hour. I hope you watch this every Monday night. Uh, she takes whatever issue we're dealing with here in Congress 
and organizes those special orders so that we can actually beat the drum and let America know what the Congress is doing, specifically what the Congressional Black Caucus is doing. So thank you for continuing to elect such a brilliant woman, and I just want to acknowledge and thank her for her support. Also, let me thank uh, Western, excuse me, Case Western Reserve President, your president, Barbara Snyder, also your provost, Baselick, Baselack, excuse me, Dean Gilmore, and the entire Case Western family for inviting me today to speak with you at this wonderful symposium. Listening to Congressman Stoke list some of the speakers, I tell you, it humbles me to be one of those speakers now. Uh, I really wish I were there with you. Also, I've got to thank uh, Adrian Dziak, Dziak, excuse me, and Maureen Graves for all of their hard work in organizing this event. And let me just take a moment to say the last time I was in Cleveland actually was the for the funeral of my dear friend, Congresswoman Stephanie Tubbs-Jones. Congressman Stokes introduced me to Stephanie. Uh, and I had visited Cleveland on many occasions with Stephanie, doing housing forums, town meetings, visiting the community. Um, I really miss Stephanie, miss her physical presence. Uh, she was my best friend, and I, I still love her through all of you and the wonderful people of Cleveland. So uh, thank you for sending us Stephanie, and uh, thank you, Lou, for introducing me to Stephanie early on, uh, because, as I said, we became the best of friends, and I miss her tremendously. I'm honored to speak with you today during this very important forum on public service and in civic engagement. And let me uh, take a minute to thank um, my communications director, Nikki Williams, who's from um, Cleveland, and she's here with me today. Uh, and uh, we have the Cleveland spirit going, and, and she keeps me on track. And so give, give Nikki a round of applause. I know she wanted to come home today also. <laughs> Nikki, come up here so, so everybody can see you. <laughs> <laughs> Someone gave you a shout out. <laughs> I want to just speak for you, with you for a few moments uh, on the topic of our CBC agenda, Opportunities for All, Pathways Out of Poverty, and also talk just a little bit about my journey from public assistance, which I was on as a young mother, uh, to public service. All public servants uh, have a story to tell about how they came to be a politician. Some of them good, some of them not so good. Some politicians uh, are in it simply for personal gain. Um, it's not about what they can do for their neighbor, their community, their country, and the world. It's only about what they gain personally, the money, the notoriety, the power. But I can tell you the CBC members, Congressman Stokes knows, is one of the founders of the CBC, they come here with a mission and with a purpose. And let, let me just uh, mention the health care bill, with, which Congresswoman Fudge uh, talked to you a little bit about. But the president, uh, Congressman Stokes, just called me five minutes ago while Congresswoman Fudge was talking. And he wanted to thank us, and he wanted to thank the CBC, because the CBC uh, weighed in in a big way on this health care reform bill and really made it a much better bill. And so he communicated directly to me to let the CBC know, and our constituents know, that he thanked them so much for their support. And for our votes. There are public servants um, who come in, such as our President Barack Obama and Congresswoman Fudge, uh, to serve the public. They see an opportunity to effect change and empower their communities and truly want to give back to those who have given them so much. They take the gifts that they have been blessed with and work to make the world a better place. It's an honor to be the current chair of the Congressional Black Caucus that was founded, uh, Congressman Stokes, you know, 40 years now ago, and the 12 other members uh, of Congress, and since day one, uh, has been known as and continues to be the conscience of the Congress. Historically, the Congressional Black Caucus understands that we have a moral obligation to address, and I mean moral obligation, to address inequality and injustice as never before in history. That's what we saw in terms of this health care reform bill. It was our moral imperative to deal with this. We believe that we have a responsibility and an obligation to eradicate poverty, 
by utilizing the full constitutional power and obligation and statutory authority and resources of our government to provide opportunities for all and to develop pathways out of poverty because you know the huge poverty rates disproportionately affect the African American and communities of color. So we have to do this through job training, livable wages, education, affordable housing, economic empowerment, all of those issues that you know so well. So upon entering the chairpersonship of the CBC, it was my goal to establish an agenda that I felt reflected the most pressing needs in our communities and set the CBC on a bold course, and I mean bold course, toward effecting real and tangible change. In developing our agenda for this Congress, we came to the following conclusions. Government has two moral missions, protection and empowerment. Protection includes military and police protection, but also worker, consumer, and environmental protection. Empowerment includes building and maintaining infrastructure, education, the economy, the court system, creating jobs. No one can make a living in America without protection and empowerment by the government. The government has to provide those opportunities, has to be the foundation for individual responsibility. The government has a further moral mission to ensure that government protection and empowerment extends equally to everyone. That is moral equality, where there's a major disparity between the rich and the poor, or between one race or gender or another, there's really what we call a moral gap. The job of government is to help America fill in these moral gaps, which we see so greatly in the poor communities in our country and communities of color. This led us to what has been our shared agenda for the 111th Congress, opportunities for all and pathways out of poverty, which we believe is working to fill these moral gaps. It's up on our website, and Congressman Stokes will be happy to send you copies of our year-end report and our legislative update to pass out. We have six areas of focus in this agenda. One, to promote education, reinvestment in low-income and disadvantaged communities. Two, increase access to economic security. Three, eliminate health disparities. And I tell you, once again, I just have to say the disparities provisions of this health care bill are awesome. Most of what the CBC had in our Health Care uh, Equity and Accountability Act now, we fought very hard. The president support us in including that in this health care reform bill. So that's part of our agenda in terms of these moral gaps that we see as being critical to close. Also provide for just housing options. We know what's happening in, the four, in Cleveland. I've been there many times. I've seen the devastating effect of the foreclosure crisis. We've got to address this in a big way, much more than what we're doing now. Also part of this agenda is to strengthen civil rights and judicial reform, Youth Promise Act, closing these disparities between crack and powder cocaine. We're beginning to make some progress in that area. And also we must address uh, global poverty. Of course, um, I serve on the Foreign Affairs Committee and on the Appropriations Subcommittee on Foreign Operations, and so much of my work has been about addressing global health issues, global poverty, empowerment of people in Africa and the Caribbean, and making sure that we provide the resources necessary to address global poverty. So this is a shared agenda. It's also, and I mentioned a few personal experiences, very personal to my life experience. Much of what's included in this agenda has a connection to where I've been in life, like so many of, of you and your parents and grandparents, uh, and um, it has really had a profound uh, impact on my life, many of the disparities and moral gaps that, that I'm talking about. My life's trajectory has always been moving toward a life of public service, even though I really didn't know that. But I often tell the story of my birth in El Paso, Texas. Uh, after waiting for hours in the sweltering hot halls uh, of an El Paso hospital, my mother, Mildred, was finally entered. You know, they didn't want her to, they would not allow her to enter into the hospital when she was in labor having me, uh, or about to have me. She needed a C-section, but they would not admit her into the hospital because she was black. Well, my grandmother, uh, who, and I know, especially Lou, I know you know what I'm talking about, my grandmother looked white. Uh, and my grandmother 
you know, was the product of um, or the child of of a rape, uh, an Irishman who was um, my great grandmother worked for in Louisiana. And so this man repeatedly raped my great grandmother. And so she had these two children who looked half Irish. And so the hospital kind of looked at my grandmother and looked at my mother and said, well, my mother kind of looks sort of white. And my grandmother looked almost white. And so they had this confusion about who my mother was. So my grandmother, bottom line, has had to fight like hell to get my mother into the hospital. By the time I got, my mother got in the hospital, they put her on, as she called a gurney, and lay, left her there. And soon she became delirious. She became unconscious and almost died. And so... The doctors finally decided to tend to her, but it was um, it was much, much too late for a C-section. So they rushed her into the delivery room, didn't know what to do. Uh, and again, my mother was unconscious. Finally, uh, they decided that the only thing they could do was to do a forceps delivery. And so they delivered me using forceps, and I had a scar above my eye until very recently. And I tell this story because I came into this world... You know, as a result of discrimination, racism, I almost didn't get here. So I had to fight just to get into, just to breathe, just to live. My mother told me this uh, story as a child, and that's a reminder to me each and every day of why I have to fight against injustice wherever I see it. And that... That fight continued through my formative years. Living in Texas during the time of Jim Crow, we often faced turbulent times. I can vividly remember the blatant and stifling racism, not only of the South, but when I moved to California. Uh, these racist attitudes followed my family uh, when we moved to California in 1960. And again, many life-altering experiences I had there. I wanted to be a cheerleader, for example, at San Fernando High School in the 60s. Well, cheerleaders were selected by a small committee, and they only wanted cheerleaders who had blonde hair and blue eyes. Well, I want to be a cheerleader. Of course, you can see I don't have blonde hair and blue eyes. And I went to the NAACP. I was 14 years old. You know, by then, you know, my grandfather had been part of the NAACP, my mother in Texas. And so my family was really very active to try to shatter some of these glass ceilings and break down some of these barriers of segregation and racism. So I, what could I do except go to the NAACP as a, a high school student and say, look, I want to be a cheerleader. So they organized and we organized and um, we finally were able to convince the school, but it took a lot of outside agitation to change the rules so that cheerleaders or young girls who wanted to be cheerleaders could be elected so there'd be a fair process. So I was able to work with the NAACP to change the rules of the game of the selection process. They finally decided every girl could try out who wanted to be a cheerleader. And guess what? I tried out and I became the first African-American cheerleader at San Fernando High School. That was my first election. That was my first election. I was about 15 years old. I share these stories because it's very important to recognize that a lot of us who came to Congress didn't come here through, um, you know, privileged lives and backgrounds. When I moved to the Bay Area, um, I ended up becoming a, a single mother of two young, young boys. Unfortunately, I went through... Uh, the system of public assistance and food stamps and Medi-Cal uh, ended up being a battered woman. You know, I could go on and on and on, but I know a lot of you can relate to what I'm talking about. <laughs> and so as a member of Congress, these personal experiences drive me. You know, I won't cut. I won't vote to cut any kind of public assistance for anyone, senior citizens, the disabled, women, children. That's wrong. In fact, today I'm going to the Rules Committee as one of CBC's agenda items 
to try to make the argument for an extension of public assistance, an emergency $2.5 billion extension for TANF, because you know that runs out. And given our economic climate, we need to have an extension of that. Hopefully we'll win that fight, but that's something that we're working on very hard. So, you know, let's see what happens, but I'll have to go down there in a few minutes. But those are the kinds of issues we have to tackle, and I think it's important to recognize that once – you have made it through college or through whatever you're going through, if you have those kind of challenges, it's important to use those experiences, not just to move forward yourself, but to help others and to make this a better country and to make this a better world. And that is what I know members of the CBC are doing, because most members of the CBC didn't come here like many other members came with a lot of money and a lot of background in politics. When you look at um, our jobs agenda, for example, the latest unemployment report reminds us that the jobs crisis, the economic crisis, is twice as bad as the national average. The African-American unemployment rate is over 15 percent, national average about 9 percent. So we're working on a jobs bill. A real jobs bill. And Congressman Stokes, I don't know if you saw recently, but we um, voted against the rule of this previous bill, which was, they called it a jobs bill, but it was really a business tax credit bill. And we said enough is enough. If we're going to have a jobs bill, then we're going to have a real jobs bill. We're not going to have a business tax credit bill that is like one small drop in the bucket that may or may not create jobs for the chronically unemployed. But we have to have a real jobs package. And so the CBC decided that Again, enough was enough, and the majority of us voted against the rule uh, and to send that message that, you know, no more will we let this happen. And then we voted against the bill, for the most part. And, uh, you know, the president, of course, signed the bill into law, and it's, you know, it's, a, I think, 15, 17 billion pe business tax credit bill. But the speaker, the president, and uh, Senator Bacchus and Senator Reid know that the CBC is right and that we're moving forward now. As I said, I'm going to the Rules Committee today to try to get an extension of TANF, but we have to have a summer youth job program for our young people because our young people, we have to have that. Our young people now, because of what's happening to their parents in this economic downturn, they have to help buy the food, they have to help pay the rent, and so we're insisting on a summer youth job program that makes a lot of sense for our communities. Also, we want formula in any jobs package that targets areas of highest unemployment and high underemployment. And that means, of course, in urban areas and rural areas where we have people of color, it just happens that those are the areas. And so we want a Puma language formula, which is a, not a complicated formula, but what it is is it targets a certain percentage of federal dollars in any job creation effort into areas of 15 percent higher uh, poverty rates or 10 percent higher unemployment. Also, we're pushing for a direct job creation effort. When you look at what's happening in the green industry and in the technological world, in the healthcare sector and infrastructure, we want people who've been chronically unemployed to be able to be eligible and qualified for these jobs. But because of the chronicness of these unemployment rates, people have been unemployed, not just since this recession, but for years, we have to have a workforce training component. We have to have a an apprenticeship training component and a pre-apprenticeship training component if, in fact, the chronically unemployed are going to be part into the mainstream economic picture. So we're fighting for that. They get it, you know, the powers that be. And I tell you, with 42 members of the Congressional Black Caucus standing strong, uh, I think you know, we're making some progress. It's slow, but we're making progress. And so for those of you, uh, you know, we, and I always ask you to contact, your Congresswoman is leading on this effort because she has a district like my district, like all of our districts, that um, is desperate for jobs. And so our Congressional Black Caucus members get it and are pushing this. But you need to help us by calling other members of Congress, your senators, and say support the CBC jobs agenda. It is so important that that be done. Finally, let me just say, uh, 
as it relates to the founding of the Congressional Black Caucus, before I conclude, uh, Congressman Stokes knows this, uh, but I wanted to share this with you. I was a student in Mills College in the early 70s, had a course in uh, government. I've only taken one class in political science, mind you. And my professor wanted part of the course to include field work. And field work and internships are really very important, as you know, at Case Western. Well, part of the field work she required us to do was to work in a presidential campaign. Well, during that time, it was McGovern, Muskie, and Humphrey running. And uh, I said I was going to flunk it, the class. I said, you flunk me. I've never flunked a class, but I am not going to work in any of those guys' campaigns because I don't believe they're speaking to the issues that myself as a single woman with two little kids trying to get through college on public assistance, I didn't think any of those guys were really uh, addressing those issues that millions of Americans had to address. So I told my professor, I'm not working in any of these campaigns, just flunk me. During that time, I was president of the Black Student Union, and we invited the first African-American woman elected to Congress to come to speak to the BSU. I was at Mills College, a woman's college in Oakland. Lo and behold, it was Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm who came to campus. And Congresswoman Chisholm, she spoke Spanish fluently. She was a strong supporter for uh, comprehensive immigration reform. She was a supporter for health care reform. She wanted to end the war in Vietnam. She talked about poverty. And then she said she was running for president. I said, what? You know, it was hard to believe. The press hadn't reported that. So after the... Um, after the BSU town meeting, I went up to her and I said, Congresswoman Chisholm, you know, I have a class I'm about ready to flunk. You know, I had my big afro, jeans, t-shirt, you know, I'm very militant. I was working with the Black Panther Party on the breakfast, breakfast program and all of their great 10-point programs. So that was my history. You know, I was working in the community and I was going to school and I didn't want to get involved in politics, never registered vote. So Congresswoman Chisholm says, well, my dear, if you really believe in all that you say you believe in, and if you really want to change this country and make things better, she said, I'd advise you first to register to vote. And I said, she said, no way, not me. She said, yes. So she took me to task about my lack of involvement in the political process. So I reluctantly agreed. Then I said, okay, now I have this class. Again, I'm getting ready to flunk it, but maybe I'll work in your campaign uh, just to pass this class because I like what you stand for. So I asked her um, how to get involved in her campaign. And she said, well, my dear, these other guys have lots of money. They have a lot of uh, national money. They're, you know, well-funded. I don't have a lot of money. I'm just leaving it up to my local people who believe in me to run my grassroots campaigns. I said, okay, well, we'll find someone. So I went back, I told my professor that I had reconsidered this course now, and I do my field work, and I asked her how to get involved in the Chisholm campaign. Well, of course, no one knew, uh, you know, because she didn't have a major campaign. Well, come to find out, um, there was no campaign in Alameda County, in Oakland, California, where I'm from. So I ended up actually organizing the Northern California Shirley Chisholm presidential primary campaign from my course at Mills College, and Shirley wrote about this in her book, and we actually took 10% of the vote in Alameda County. I ended up becoming a Shirley Chisholm delegate and went to Miami for the 1972 Democratic Convention. So that is my story, <laughs> and Congressman Stokes, let me thank you once again for this wonderful opportunity. I really wish I were there with you. Uh, I guess we have a few minutes for questions and answers, uh, but just let me thank you for supporting Congresswoman Fudge. Thank you for your spirit. My uh, godparents live in Cleveland. Uh, I love your community, and I hope to get there maybe next year, Lou. Hopefully, somehow, this House session and the schedule will allow me to be with you in person. Thank you, and God bless you. Thank you very much, Congresswoman Lee. I'm Joe White. I'm chair of the political science department. I'm supposed to moderate a discussion here. And uh, the original idea was that uh, Professor Miller and I would make a few remarks to start with. I'd like to ask him to come up, but also uh, I believe that Congresswoman Lee's uh, time is limited, 
So um, I would like to ask if people uh, are thinking of questions they would like to ask, please come to the front of the, uh, of the hall where there's a microphone so we can uh, uh, hear your questions. And um, I think we'll do this a little differently than planned. I think it makes sense to, uh, to have a couple of st student questions first. So um, if that is all right, I would also like to say in the spirit of these comments, I wish to be associated with all the well-deserved praise that our distinguished colleagues and guests have given to each other, and to thank them all, and you all too, for participating today. <laughs> um, <laughs> Miss. Hi, my name is Kevin e. Gilmore. Representative Lee, you are so cool and down to earth. <laughs> this seems like I, could, I really can see myself there now because you introduced yourself and you seem like you're definitely for the people. Now, I know that the questions have to be very uh, reduced, but there's a point that I have to make because it's very serious to me. Unlike most of the people that are in this room, I went to college simply because I needed a place to stay. I'm a foster care alumni of Cuyahoga County, and this is an issue to me that is sometimes overlooked on Capitol Hill. Although I had the opportunity to intern for Senator Kerry's office, and he was very responsive of getting on bills, I would so love for the Black Caucus to jump on this issue. Um, after my first year of college, I ended up homeless. I slept in my car. I lied um, and said that I had been a battered woman to get into different shelters. And I know that people who are in foster care will not have health care. 22% uh, of them even entertain the thought of college or graduate. Most of them end up homeless, and most of them end up incarcerated. And predominantly in Cleveland, they're African-American youth. So I really uh, hope that this is an issue that can be just as mainstream as health care, because these are people's lives who are going to be impacted and end up in the system in some sort of way. Thank you. know that foster care, health care, all those issues you talked about, the Congressional Black Caucus is very focused on because, as I say, this health care reform bill is definitely going to help our young people who are in foster care, but also our criminal justice reform efforts, our efforts at housing, and, and all of the specific issues around foster care. We have a broad agenda for that. So thank you, and, and again, congratulations to you for your successes. Miss. Um, hello, my name is Jessica Daniels and I attend John Hay School of Architecture and Design. And my question is, how did you overcome poverty? What made you like want to achieve your goals? What was that breaking point? Well, first of all, I, I have to say I, I, I'm a person of faith, so prayer helped me a lot in terms of just my faith personally, my family, my friends, but also my determination. I was not going to let anything take me over. You know, even though I've had many, many setbacks, I was very focused on my children, wanting to make sure my children didn't have to go through what I went through. And also, the system was so horrible in how they treated me that I never want anyone to have to go through that mistreatment again in life. And so I have no option but to work each and every day to make the world and life better for, for others who you know, could find themselves in similar uh, circumstances. So it's, I, I shared with you my birth and how I came into this world. So for me, it's I have no option but to do the, these things, even though I've had these setbacks, which of course I had to uh, overcome. Thank you. I, I'm going to take the opportunity to pose a different question while waiting to see if anybody else walks up there. Um, this is the Stokes, Lewis Stokes Leadership Symposium on Social Issues in the Community, and of course we've seen, we couldn't see a, a, a more important example of uh, questions of leadership and of social issues than what has been going on with health care. Uh, but it also raises a general issue about your work as a congressperson, which is that one aspect of leadership is knowing when to compromise and when to refuse to compromise or hang tough. And I'd like to know, uh, how you think about that as a legislator, perhaps particularly in the example of the health care bill, which is by no means to a lot of people an ideal bill, 
But how do you think about when you compromise and when you hang tough? <laughs> That's always the dilemma that one struggles with. Uh, if you're, if you have a moral compass, and you haven't lost that once you get elected, which oftentimes people do. Uh, I think there are two examples. One is Congressman Stokes mentioned um, my voting against uh, giving Bush and any president the authority to use force to go to war forever. It was a blank check. It was a terrible authorization. I voted against it. You have to decide where your principles are. You have to know what your bottom lines are. I'm not going to vote for war. You know, I am not going to vote for war. There are other ways you solve the world's crisis. Now, of course, I'm not looking at the world through rose-colored glasses. And if our country is in danger of an imminent at attack, our Constitution, the United Nations Charter, gives us the responsibility and duty to defend ourselves. So that's a given. But one, our country should not use military force uh, to begin to develop, to, to promote wars around the world to try to solve problems. I just think that is wrong. It hasn't worked in the past, and it won't work in the future. And so for me, that <laughs> that's the bottom line. As it relates to health care, and, and I said the president just called. He called me because he knew how tough I had been on this, and he knew how tough the Congressional Black Caucus had been on a public option. Uh, which was not in this final bill, and we threw down on that public option. And let me tell you, there were 60 of us who signed a letter said we weren't going to support a bill unless it had a public option. And as the process moved forward, we were able to get into the bill a general framework that may not have been called a public option, but it, there's a framework in the bill now that will hold these insurance companies accountable and make sure that uh, the rates don't gouge people like they have been in the past. And the Congressional Black Caucus worked on these provisions of the bill very diligently. When we looked at the fact that we got all of our, for the most part, health disparities provisions in this bill, when we recognized that we got our children's provisions in this bill, the expansion of community health clinics at $11 billion, an increase in uh, funding for historically black colleges and universities and minority-serving institutions for $2 billion, expansion of Pell Grants and all of the good educational provisions, as well as additional health care provisions, at least four, 32 million people will be covered now, which uh, is a major step in the right direction. And so in that instance, we compromise because we want to make sure that we had that foundation to move forward because I support single-payer. I don't know if, if uh, Ohio's would support single-payer. In California, I mean, single-payer is the only system that really provides for universal affordable coverage. So you know for me to give up on single-payer in this bill, for me to compromise on the public option in the sense that this bill was a first start and we can go back to the drawing board and got good provisions in. That was a very difficult thing for me to do, and the president knows that. And uh, we worked very hard. We, we met with him. We met with our leadership over and over and over again on several provisions of this bill, which were bottom line. Also on uh, women's issues, the right to privacy, the right to health care, the right to an abortion. Government should not be in the middle of a woman's right to choose. That's just bottom line. And so there were 40 or 50 of us who said this health care bill cannot be about abortion. We cannot erode Roe versus Wade. We cannot do that. We said that. We said that. We told the President that, we told the Speaker, Senator Reid, we were not going to vote for a bill that was going to allow women to go back to back alley abortions. Current law is the Hyde Amendment, which won't allow federal funds for poor women uh, to access the type of reproductive health care based on choice. I don't support the Hyde Amendment. You know, that came into uh, being in the 70s. So I would like to have repealed the Hyde Amendment in this health care reform bill. I would have liked to have done that. That's what I wanted to do. But we said we weren't going to make it about abortion, so we didn't. And so we started fighting like crazy when, when these abortion anti-choice advocates in Congress started to try to erode uh, and go beyond the Hyde Amendment. So, you know, we had to calibrate all of this. And those are the kinds of decisions you have to make. But you can't just uh, stand on principle without trying to work to get the problem solved 
uh, if there's an opportunity to do that. And so that's kind of a moral dilemma that people here in Congress have. But you have to know when to when you can, uh, you know, work with others to find some middle ground. But you also have to know when you have to stand strong and say no. And that's what I did, and that's what the CBC did very recently on this jobs bill. And believe you me, it's made a difference. Thank you very much for that detailed one, one answer. Uh, you know, do you have time for one or two more questions? From yeah, yeah, I have to, you know, I was just told by Nikki that I have to get down to the Rules Committee because I mentioned we're trying to get this $2.5 billion expansion uh, in the emergency supplemental for, for TANF, which is part of our big jobs piece. So I'm going to have to race down in just a minute. So two more questions. and then one, one more question. Okay, Nikki, it's on, on me about this. Okay, this gentleman was here first. Yep. Okay, my name is Cameron Reddick. I'm a student at Cleveland Heights, and I was just wondering, um, what type of feedback did you get from the rest of the Congress members when you didn't vote to go into Iraq? Well, the feedback was <laughs> horrible. Death threats, <laughs> you know, harassment. I had to have security for months. It was horrible. But I got to tell you one thing. On the other side of it, it opened up space for the voices of peace. And I got 60,000 emails, letters, phone calls, the majority of which were very supportive. I received communications from uh, President Mandela, from uh, Coretta Scott King, from Bishop Tutu, from those who knew what that vote was about. Also, people throughout the country began to see as time went on what this was what this meant. And, you know, it was amazing how people who were really against me, some came back and apologized. And, and I've got to just share this one story because I think it's reflective of what uh, the answer that it, it explains it a little bit. There was a woman in my district, and my district is in the East Bay. Uh, it's the 9th Congressional District, includes Oakland and Berkeley, very progressive areas, but also an area, Castro Valley, which is not as progressive as Oakland and Berkeley. And so this, a lot of the uh, hate mail came from that part of my district. A woman had written to me, calling me every name in the book, uh, harassed me, it was horrible, phone calls, and this was a young lady. And later, maybe about two years later, do you know my campaign received a $15 check from her and a letter saying, look, I was so angry at you for that. I called you a traitor. I called you, uh, th I told you that you had committed acts of treason and that I wanted to join up and come after you like everybody else. She said, since then, she said, I have seen how this has happened. I have just had a child. She said, and I read what you said and why you did it, and you were absolutely right. I apologize. I'm sorry. Here's $15 for your campaign. You know? And so that's what happened. Well. And so, you know, you have to take a stand when you know that stand is, is for for right, for good, and sooner or later, the rest of the country, the rest of the world catch up with you. Uh, let's one, hope one that more. is true of many okay. things in life. Wait a minute, there's one, one person standing there, Nikki. I'm begging Nikki. Okay. This is the last one. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Sorry, that's all right, sorry. Okay. Um, first of all, I must say um, thank you for the work that you've done on health care. There are some, uh, some definitely um, some issues that I have with the bill because I believe that it's going to expand government too much. Um, but I do thank you for all the diligent work that you're doing for the black community. Um, now, I must say this. Um, being uh, the woman of faith that you are um, and health care, and I believe that health care is a moral issue because we are to be for uh, the least of these, um, as Jesus said. Um, but here's my question. How do you reconcile your... Um, your your um, pro-choice opinions and your faith, um, seeing how as that is uh, murdering um, those uh, babies who are in the room. So how do you kind of reconcile your faith and uh, believing that health care is a faith-based issue, but yet you're for abortion? Sure, that's a very good question. And, and my position on being a pro-choice woman and, and my faith is I believe in individual rights. I believe that the government should not get in the business of making decisions for people. Not everybody believes what I believe, and that's fine. But when you have a government that tells women what they can and cannot do, that's wrong. That's fundamentally, uh, that's not religious. Thank you. Lou, I'm going to have to run. Barbara, I want to thank you. Have you. To go now. Oh, oh, one more. Wait a minute. What, what are you telling me? One more question. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay, I one more question. Barbara, I want to say something <laughs> before you leave.
There's a little stokes. I want to say something before you leave also. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. I want to, but go ahead with the one person. Okay. Uh, as a disabled in the, oh, my name is Miles Stevens. I live here in Cleveland. I'm a resident. I just wanted to say as a disabled person whose health kind of declined because I didn't have health care years ago uh, and it just kept getting worse, I wanted to thank you. Thank you very much thank you. for this health care reform. Thank you. Okay. It means thank that you, other brother. people like myself who are in poverty and uh, although we do have some excellent medical facilities here in Cleveland, such as the free clinic who goes out of their way to make sure that we have uh, some kind of health, I appreciate what you've done for us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Let, let, me, let me just make my final comment. And the needs of the disabled stay high on my agenda. My sister, since the mid-70s, um, she has been diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. I'm with her a lot. And, and I see how, while we've made some progress to making sure that there's justice and equality and access for the disabled community, we have a long way to go. So this health care bill was one more step in that direction. But be assured that the Congressional Black Caucus is going to continue to fight for access and health care uh, for the disabled. Uh, and I just thank you for, for that uh, shout out. And uh, lo you look like you're doing great, my brother. And take care of yourself. But bye. bye. Okay. Barbara, I cannot tell you, as a one of the members of the founders of the Congressional Black Caucus, when there were only about twelve of us, remembering that when I went to Congress the day I was sworn in along with Shirley Chisholm and Bill Clay, it made nine of us. There were six of us there when the day we went there. And with the 42 of you now there, 42 of you who, like you, are committing to changing this country and to making this country what every American can expect it to be. You today in your beautiful remarks made me so proud. You are awesome. We thank you for the time you've given us. You are wonderful. Let's give her a standing ovation. Let's give her a standing ovation. Let's give her a standing ovation. Thank you so much, Robert. <laughs> I'd like to make one or two comments and give Professor Miller a chance to make one or two comments. You know, the subject of this symposium is not just um, what members of Congress can do, uh, but what all of us can do, and about how all of us participate and how we deal with these social issues. And uh, if Professor Miller would like to make a couple of, would you like to comment a bit or, yeah, just, if you can close it all, all, off, yeah. I'd like to begin by thanking the person that this symposium is held for. I think the city of Cleveland, Northeast Ohio, really the nation owes a debt of gratitude to Congressman Lewis Stokes. So if anyone deserves a standing ovation, is this gentleman here. In the interest of time, I will make my comments brief. I think the essence of what the Congresswoman said could be boiled down into a few key areas. First of all, we talked about leadership. And through last night's events and the events leading up to it, it shows that leadership, you have to take stands when it isn't popular. I think Dr. King made a statement that vanity looks for the easy way out. 
we take the way that is easy instead of the way that is right. And you have to take stands as a leader for what is right, because government is not the problem. Government has to work with the people to move this country forward. We need health care. When individuals talk about its expanding government, there are millions of people, 52 million people at last estimate without health insurance. The gentleman spoke here. You're in health care nirvana if you have health insurance in Cleveland, or you may as well be in Snatch Me Back Mississippi, or Take Me Back Alabama if you don't have health care, because it is a civil right. It is something we all as Americans deserve. It's not about inequality. It is about equality. It is about freedom. It is about liberty. It's about an opportunity to live healthily, to have a life of opportunity and not to be put on the back burner because you do not have an insurance card when you arrive at the emergency room. The next point, and I want to say this to the youth, you must get involved. Congresswoman Stoke, excuse me, Congresswoman Fudge mentioned, listen, understand, and act. And as I was sitting there preparing my notes, listening to the Congresswoman speak, you must get involved. Just a quick point. I'm a city council president in South Euclid. And many times I hear people come to city council and complain about what's not being done, what's not right. And I look out in the audience and I see people well over the age of 30. We need our youth to get involved with their cities, get involved by registering to vote, Get involved by learning what the issues are in your community because these issues affect you, whether it's your roads, whether it's your health care, whether it's law enforcement, whether it's education, whether it's recreation. The list goes on and on. Educate yourself about the issues, as she said. And the most important thing is get involved. Leadership comes with a price. That price is sacrifice. That price is standing out there, taking the slings, taking the bricks, but looking at a vision saying, this is right for the community, this is right for my brothers, my sisters, my mothers, my aunts, my fathers, my grandfathers. It is a price that we must pay. It is a price that Congressman Stokes paid. It's a price that Marsha Fudge, and it's a price that Congresswoman Fox is currently paying along with her colleagues. So please, get involved. This is an important issue. We need to stay behind it because as my colleague Joe and I were talking about, this issue is not over. There are people out there today plotting to disrupt health care. So don't celebrate. You still have a lot of work to do because it is a long road to go and we must make sure we fight the good fight and continue. Thank you. Continue, and thank you very much for joining us today.